Hello, friends, and welcome to our weekly Bible study. We're so grateful that you can join us in this way online, but I want to invite and encourage you to come and join us in person every Monday night at St. Timothy Catholic Church in Laguna Niguel, California. You're welcome to be with us from 7.30 to 8.30 p.m. in the hall as we dive into the gospel reading for that upcoming Sunday liturgy. We hope that you can join us, but as you're participating here online, please know that you are still part of our community. We love you. And as you're here, please like this video and leave a comment with any questions or reflections or just to say hello, because likes and comments tell YouTube that you like this video and it might recommend it to more people. And we want to get more people engaged in the Word of God and to know about the love that God has for them. Please also make sure you subscribe to our channel so that you are notified anytime we have a new video, not only Bible study, but we do many other things that we would love for you to enjoy and participate in. But without further ado, thank you for being with us. God bless you, and enjoy the recording of this week's Monday Night Bible Study. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you. We give you thanks. You are worthy of all glory and all honor. Come Holy Spirit. Lord God, we lift up this time to you. We lift up our hearts, our minds, our spirits, offering them to you, Lord, for you to do your will. We pray, Lord, tonight that you would speak to each one of us and allow our hearts to be open and attentive to whatever message you have. And we pray, God, that this time would be laid at your feet. You would remove any spirit of worry, distraction, doubt, anything drawing us away from being attentive to your word and to your voice. And especially tonight, as we read the powerful story of your passion, that we would, we would hang on every detail and that we would not have the magnificence of what you've done be lost on us. For as many times as we have heard it, it is the source of our salvation. So help us to know the depth of your love and your mercy for us tonight as we dive into your word. We pray all of these things in your most precious name, Jesus. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come on in, have a seat. We are in Mark chapter 14 and 15. We are reading the gospel for this upcoming Sunday, which is the uh, is Palm Sunday, Palm Sunday of the Lord's Passion. And so every Palm Sunday, we read the entire Passion account, uh, depending on what gospel we are in for that cycle. So we're in cycle B, so we're in the gospel of Mark. So we're going to read Mark's account of the Passion, which is all of chapter 14 and all of chapter 15. It's a long one. We are only going to read it once, not our normal twice, so don't worry. But that means you have to be extra attentive, pay uh, close attention to the story, because, as I always say, if you've heard a story from Scripture before, it's easy to kind of gloss over it. So I want you to pretend, as best you are able, that you have never heard this story before, that you never have any images, you don't have any images or preconceived notions about the passion in your mind, so that you can fully enter in. Before we read, I want to highlight a few things in the Gospel of Mark that are different. Mark was the first gospel that was written of the four, uh, and you would think a lot of all of his details had been inherited by the others, but they are not. And I'll talk about what some of these mean, but I want you to see if you can pinpoint them as we read, okay? Uh, the first is Mark's use of the word Abba, Abba, Father. That's actually a very rare, rarely used word in the gospels. We may hear it very frequently, but it's not very frequently used in the gospels. So Mark uses that account to address or that word to address God in his account. Um, there is the uh, mystery of the naked man. I'll leave that there. Um, <laughs> you have to find where it is. Um, there's an emphasis on the false witnesses who try and accuse Christ in front of the Sanhedrin. There's a double emphasis on the fact that they are false and giving false testimony. Um, Jesus' answer to the questioning um, that he says, I am, when they ask him um, who he is. Um, a sp uh, specific detail that Barabbas, the revolutionary, was a murderer. We don't have that detail in any other gospel account, so that he was particularly a murderer. And we also have Simon of Cyrene, the name of his children, Alexander and Rufus. 
We have the name of some of the women who were traveling with Jesus. And then we have uh, the shock from Pontius Pilate that uh, Jesus is already dead when Joseph of Arimathea comes to ask for his body. Okay, so those are some unique details that do not appear in other parts or other gospel accounts of the Passion. So see if you can pay attention. Maybe you'll pinpoint or notice one or two of those. We'll talk about maybe what some of the implications of those are. But I wanted to point those out because we're only going to be reading this once through. So Mark chapter 14, starting in verse 1. The Passion of our Lord. The Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread were to take place in two days' time. So the chief priests and the scribes were seeking a way to arrest Jesus by treachery and put him to death. They said, not during the festival, for fear that they may be a riot among the people. When Jesus was in Bethany reclining at table in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of perfumed oil, costly, genuine spikenard. She broke the alabaster jar and poured it on his head. There were some who were indignant. Why has there been this waste of perfumed oil? It could have been sold for more than 300 days wages and the money given to the poor. They were infuriated with her. Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you make trouble for her? She has done a good thing for me. The poor you will always have with you. And whenever you wish, you can do good to them, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anticipated anointing my body for burial. Amen, I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed to the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went off to the chief priests to hand him over to them. When they heard him, they were pleased and promised to pay him money. Then he looked for an opportunity to hand Jesus over. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? He sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man will meet you carrying a jar of water. Follow him. Wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, The teacher says, Where is my guest room, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. Make the preparations for us there. The disciples went off, entered the city, and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, Jesus came with the twelve, and as they reclined at table and were eating, Jesus said, Amen, I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be distressed and say to him, one by one, surely it is not I. Jesus said to them, one of the twelve. The one who dips with me into the dish. For the Son of Man indeed goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would be better for that man if he had never been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them, and said, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, and they all drank from it. He said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which will be shed for many. Amen, I say to you, I shall not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Then after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, all of you will have your faith shaken, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be dispersed. But after I have been raised up, I shall go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even though all should have their faith shaken, mine will not be. Then Jesus said to him, Amen, I say to you, this very night before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he vehemently replied, Even though I should have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they all spoke similarly. Then they came to a place named Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter, James, and John, and began to be troubled and distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is sorrowful even to death. Remain here and keep watch. He advanced a little and fell to the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass by him. He said, Abba, Father, 
All things are possible to you. Take this cup away from me, but not what I will, but what you will. When he returned, Jesus found them asleep. He said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray that you may not undergo the test. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Withdrawing again, he prayed, saying the same thing. Then he returned once more and found them asleep, for they could not keep their eyes open and did not know what to answer him. Jesus returned a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is to be handed over to sinners. Get up, let us go. See, my betrayer is at hand. Then, while Jesus was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived, accompanied by a crowd with swords and clubs who had come from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. His betrayer had arranged a signal with them, saying, The man I shall kiss is the one. Arrest him and lead him away securely. He came and immediately went over to him and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. At this they laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. One of the bystanders drew his sword, struck the high priest's servant, and cut off his ear. Jesus said to them in reply, Have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs to seize me? Day after day I was with you teaching in the temple area, yet you did not arrest me, but that the scriptures may be fulfilled. And they all left him and fled. Now a young man followed him, wearing nothing but a linen cloth about his body. They seized him. But he left the cloth behind and ran off naked. They led Jesus away to the high priest, and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. Peter followed him at a distance into the high priest's courtyard and was seated with the guards, warming himself at the fire. The chief priests and the entire Sanhedrin kept trying to obtain testimony against Jesus in order to put him to death, but they found none. Many gave false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. Some took the stand and testified falsely against him, alleging, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days I will build another not made with hands. Even so, their testimony did not agree. The high priest rose before the assembly and questioned Jesus, saying, Have you no answer? What are these men testifying against you? But he was silent and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him and said to him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Then Jesus answered, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. At that, the high priest tore his garments and said, What further need have we of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as deserving to die. Some began to spit on him. They blindfolded him and struck him and said to him, Prophesy! And the guards greeted him with blows. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the high priest's maids came along. Seeing Peter warming himself, she looked intently at him and said, You too were with the Nazarene, Jesus. But Peter denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you are talking about. So he went out into the outer court. Then the cock crowed. The maid saw him and began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. Once again he denied it. A little later the bystanders said to Peter once more, Surely you are one of them, for you too are a Galilean. He began to curse and to swear. I do not know this man about whom you are talking. And immediately... A cock crowed a second time. Then Peter remembered the word that Jesus had said to him, Before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. He broke down and wept. As soon as morning came, the chief priests with the elders and the scribes, that is, the whole Sanhedrin, held a council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate questioned him, Are you the king of the Jews? He said to him in reply, You say so. The chief priests accused Jesus of many things. Again Pilate questioned him, Have you no answer? See how many things they accuse you of? Jesus gave him no further answer. 
so that Pilate was amazed. Now on the occasion of the feast, Pilate used to release to them one prisoner whom they requested. A man called Barabbas was then in prison along with the rebels who had committed murder in a rebellion. The crowd came forward and began to ask him to do for them as he was accustomed. Pilate answered, Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? For he knew that it was out of envy that the chief priests had handed him over. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate again said to them in reply, Then what do you want me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted again, Crucify him! Peter said to them, Why, what evil has he done? Pilate said to them, Why, what evil has he done? They only shouted the louder, Crucify him! So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas to them, and after he had Jesus scourged, handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is, the praetorium, and assembled the whole cohort. They clothed him in purple, and weaving a crown of thorns, placed it on him. They began to salute him with, Hail, King of the Jews, and kept striking his head with a reed and spitting on him. They knelt before him in homage, and when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak, dressed him in his own clothes, and led him out to crucify him. They pressed into service a passerby, Simon a Cyrenian, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. They brought him to the place of Golgotha, which is translated place of the skull. They gave Jesus wine drugged with myrrh, but he did not take it. Then they crucified him and divided his garments by casting lots for them to see what each should take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. With him they crucified two revolutionaries, one on his right and one on his left. Those passing by reviled him, shaking their heads and saying, Aha! You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself by coming down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests with the scribes mocked Jesus among themselves and said, He saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross that we might see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also kept abusing him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three o'clock, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of the bystanders who heard it said, Look, he's calling Elijah. One of them ran, soaked a sponge with wine, put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see if Elijah comes to take him down. Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. The veil of the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. When the centurion who stood facing him saw how he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. There were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of the younger James and of Joseph, and Salome. These women had followed him when he was in Galilee and ministered to him. There were also many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. When it was already evening, since it was the day of preparation, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a distinguished member of the council, who was himself awaiting the kingdom of God, came and courageously went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was amazed that he was already dead. He summoned the centurion and asked him if Jesus had already died. And when he learned of it from the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph. Having bought a linen cloth, he took Jesus down, wrapped him in the linen cloth, and laid him in a tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance to the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, watched where he was laid. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to read this two more times. Just kidding. Um, 
So a lot here, obviously, uh, a very uh, long, passionate account. Very important that we hear this every Palm Sunday and every Good Friday. Um, but a myriad of different things could have resonated with you or have stood out. So I invite you to take a few moments to reflect back on those things. Hopefully you highlighted, underlined, wrote some things down. Um, but take a few moments to do that, and then we'll spend about the next 10 to 15 minutes just discussing at your tables what stood out to you, why do you think it did, uh, what questions do you have about this particular account of the Passion, and then we'll bring it back together for some teaching and some Q&A after about 10 to 15 minutes. So if you're watching this later, please let us know what stands out to you, but for those of us here, go ahead and take the next 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, but a few things I want to point out, and then we can open it up for questions. Um, we're back in the Gospel of Mark. We've been kind of bouncing around during the Lenten season and John and elsewhere. And so a, a little reminder about Mark. Mark, or John Mark, was a traveling companion of both Paul and primarily Peter. So this is sometimes called the Gospel of Peter. And is believed to have been uh, primarily written to persecuted Christians in Rome. It was the first Gospel written somewhere around 55 AD. And uh, it's believed to have been written to those in Rome, first of all, because Mark is a derivative of the Roman name Mars for the god of war, would have given him some clout with Roman society. And he presents Jesus as a figure of great power and authority, something that would have been appealing to those in Rome, a god of action, a messiah who is constantly at odds and in tension with the secular powers that be. And who is the first person to proclaim that Jesus is the Son of God in Mark but a Roman centurion? So it would have been very easy for this audience to align with acknowledging that this person, Jesus, was the Messiah and this Messiah was in some way for them. And so we have a very kind of uh, just getting the message out there. Mark is just putting story after story after story. This happened, then this happened, then this happened. Just to get you to this point to understand that God became flesh to offer himself for the salvation of your sins. Again, a God of action, a God of power, one that they very well could have related to and understood based on their experience of Roman authority and the power that they had seen, the authority that they had often witnessed being exercised. So that's, that's a little bit about Mark and why Jesus is presented in the way that he is. And we have kind of boom, 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 scene after scene after scene. And in all the gospels, we have this triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. And it's kind of sandwiched or creates a sandwich with the triumphant entry, the agony of defeat, and then the triumph of the resurrection. And yet, the triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem is not like a warrior emperor on a stallion or on a chariot. It's on a humble donkey, coming in lowly, almost setting the stage for the fact that he is going to be a leader of sacrifice and of service. And so, I want to. What I think it's always important to point out when we talk about the passion is exactly what Jesus was intending to do here. What Jesus was intending to do was not just die for our sins, but he wanted to institute a new Passover. Jesus comes to Jerusalem to die during Passover so that he will meet the qualifications for the Passover in Exodus. You can read about the Passover in Exodus chapter 12. It gives the instructions for the Passover, the very first Passover, which is part of the 10th and final plague of God upon Egypt so that Moses would be able to lead the Hebrew people to their freedom from slavery, where they had been enslaved for hundreds of years. And so God tells them, you're going to take a lamb who is a year old, who is spotless without blemish, a year old male lamb, and you are going to take him on the 10th day of Nisan, which is a Hebrew month, and you're going to keep him until the 14th day of Nisan to ensure he is without blemish. And then you will slaughter him in a public gathering and assembly. And then you will roast the flesh of the lamb and eat it with bitter herbs and with unleavened bread. And you will dress as though you are in flight, ready to leave. And if you spread the blood of this lamb upon your doorposts, the angel of death, when it flies over Egypt, will preserve you from death and you will be saved and you will be able to <coughs> Be delivered from your enslavement in Egypt. Jesus, when he enters into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, it is the 10th day of Nisan, the day where people would choose those unblemished lambs. And he is kept in the eyes of the Sanhedrin until the 14th day of Nisan, which is Good Friday, where he is slaughtered in a public assembly and his blood is spread across the post of the cross so that we could be saved from sin and death and be delivered from the enslavement that sin has on our own lives. And we see, it's not just symbolic, that Jesus actually, he performs a Passover meal. And a Passover meal has very strict instructions. If you've ever been to a Seder meal or a Passover, you know this. 
And how it typically goes is there's a blessing of the festival and of the dinner, and there's a drinking of four cups of wine throughout this meal. The first cup is drank, there's a presentation of some of the food, uh, and then the youngest person there, often a son to a father, but the youngest person will ask the oldest person, why is this night different from all other nights? And then the father will recount the story of the Exodus, the delivery of the Hebrew people from slavery in Egypt. They will... Uh, they will give a word of praise and thanksgiving. They'll sing some of the psalms, and then they will exchange the second cup of wine. And when this happens, they will then uh, have the meal that has been prepared, the Passover lamb that has been slaughtered in Jerusalem. Now, it was specified in Leviticus that this would be an annual festival, and in Deuteronomy 16 that this would, the slaughtering of this animal would have to happen within the city of Jerusalem for all those who were within a certain radius to make pilgrimage, one of the three annual pilgrimage feasts to Jerusalem. So they had to do this there. And so they've done this. They've been faithful to the Hebrew law. They've slaughtered this, uh, this, or they've meant to have been slaughtered this lamb. But you notice in the reading of this text, there is no lamb mentioned. There is no lamb being uh, exchanged. They are only eating bread and drinking wine because Jesus is himself the lamb of God. And instead of sticking to the script during the meal, it even says this during the Lord's Supper, while they were eating, Verse 22 of Matthew 12, so we know this is after the second cup. He exchanges the third cup, the cup of blessing and thanksgiving. And instead of using the traditional Passover prayer, he institutes new words. He says, this is the blood of my covenant, of the, the new covenant, a covenant that was promised in Jeremiah 31, one that would be a new way in which people could be in relationship with God and be redeemed. He's being very specific about what he's doing here. And then he ends the Passover meal. He breaks the script, and instead of exchanging the final cup of wine, he says, I shall not drink again the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. They skip over that part of the script, and then they end the Passover meal with the singing of a Hillel psalm, which is going into the, 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 the Mount of Olives. And actually, the very last thing they would do would be to, to drink this final cup of wine. So he delays that. He doesn't disrupt the order. But he doesn't finish the Passover meal until he is on the cross. He's offered wine once that's mixed with myrrh. He refuses it at the beginning of the crucifixion. And then later on, after he cries out to God in verse 36 of chapter 15, one of them ran, soaked a sponge with wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink. And then the next verse, Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the veil of the sanctuary was torn in two. The moment that Jesus completes the Passover meal... He enters into the kingdom of God as he promised. He comes and he completes what he intended to do to establish a new Passover. And it is not a perpetual Passover that needs to be done every year. It is one Passover that we represent every time we gather for mass. And we do not have lamb. We present the sacrifice of the once and for all lamb of God who died for our sins. And he died a very brutal and a very awful death for your sin and for mine. I want you to think of the person that you love the most in this world. Think of the person you love the most in this world. And imagine what it would be like for them to experience the most unimaginable suffering they could ever experience. That is the heart of God the Father looking at the Son Jesus for what he did for us. And now imagine he's looking at his Son offering this this sacrifice for our sins, the person he loves more than anyone in this world suffering the most unimaginable suffering for people who hate him. For people who hate him. And yet he does it for them. On the night of his death, when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, we read in some of the other Gospels that Jesus actually begins to sweat blood. This is a real biological condition called hematidrosis, where you're so stressed and anxious that the capillaries in your pores start to break down. You start to seep blood out of your pores. And then he is inflicted all of these beatings and this mockery and this mock trial in the Sanhedrin. He's crowned with thorns, these long, several inch long thorns bashed into his head. He's scourged. 39 to 40 lashes, the most that it was considered humane to inflict by Jewish law, perhaps even more because it was under Roman executors who had no boundary for how much they could torture a person, using a whip that at the end of it had pieces of bone and glass that would dig into your flesh as it tore away every time it came into contact. The amount of blood loss, the amount of shock, the, the 
the skin seeking to clot every time the cross beam was touching the back of Jesus. Every movement, every slip, every fall, so mind-numbingly and shockingly painful. Every step that he took. And then he is nailed through the radial nerves of his wrists, his ankles, or his feet to the cross. His shoulders separated as much as six inches, dislocated from their sockets. And because of the massive amount of shock and blood loss, fluid starts to build up around his heart and in his lungs called pleural effusion and pericardial effusion to where his, his lungs begin to fill up with fluid to the point where every time he has to breathe, he has to push himself up on the nail in his ankles or in his feet so that he can take a breath and then slowly sink back down, being hung by his dislocated shoulders, doing that for six hours as he bleeds all, every drop of his blood out on the cross for you and for me, as his body continues to try and clot to the wood of the cross every time he shivers up and down, splinters in those open wounds. And what eventually kills him is asphyxiation from the fluid in his lungs. He can no longer have the energy to push himself up to breathe. He drowns of the fluid in his lungs and around his heart. That is why when he is pierced on the side, blood and water come out. Real medical conditions real biological realities that Jesus suffered for you and for me so that he could institute this new Passover so that every time we come to Mass, we're meant to remember the magnificence and the horror of that sacrifice. And yet we sit in the pews, bored, minds wandering, coming in late, leaving early, not engaging, not preparing, not recognizing the gift that you and I have been given. That's why it's so important to remember and reflect on this story often. Why it's such a blessing to read through it in different accounts throughout Holy Week. You'll hear the account from John, I believe, on Friday if you go to Good Friday services. How necessary it is for us to recognize the depth of God's love for us. That is what he desired to do for you, God bless you, and for me because of our sin. He loved you so much, he would rather die and suffer than spend eternity without you. That's what we remember when we read this. All the details, all the questions are important. We'll talk about some of them as we have time in our closing 15 minutes. But, but that really is the heart of it. And following him is not a cookie cutter thing either. His sacrifice was messy and so is following him. And so I want to point to one detail before we open it up for question. <clears throat> And it's the naked man. Many scholars believe that that very well could be Mark himself. Who else would have known that there was a naked man who lost his clothing other than the author of this gospel? But also the, the word that's used for the linen garment that he is wearing is called a sindone or a sindona. It's a garment that is worn by a newly initiated or newly baptized convert. And so scholars also indicate that this man, whoever he is, symbolizes the fact that when we are baptized into discipleship in Jesus, it is not going to be easy, that we are literally going to be stripped of all that we have and be cast away, persecuted, following the Lord, who also was stripped and persecuted. In fact, it relates to a little-known prophecy in the prophet Amos, chapter 2, verse 16. On the day of the Lord, it says, And the most stout-hearted of warriors shall flee naked on that day, says the Lord prophesying before that all of us, Peter, Judas, all of the disciples, and all of us can be tempted at any moment to say no to how uncomfortable following Jesus can be, to say no to the suffering and the persecution that can sometimes come with the territory when we decide to live set apart, live differently in our pursuit of Jesus. But that is not an excuse to reject him, to turn away. Because the very next time we see that word, sindone or sindona, is in Mark chapter 16. In verse 5, when they enter the tomb, on entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a sindone, a white robe. And they were utterly amazed. And he said to them, do not be amazed. You see Jesus of Nazareth, the crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. That even in the midst of that suffering and persecution, even when we are tempted to run away, even in moments when we are stripped of literally everything that we have for the sake of the gospel, 
We can plant our feet firmly in the hope of the resurrection. And that man, whether it's Mark or a symbolic person in the Gospels, whoever it is, reminds us of both of those realities, both the suffering and persecution and the hope that is promised. Is it Mark? We don't know. Could be. Could just be some dude. Who knows? That being said, any questions, things that you uh, had stand out to you, things you'd like clarified? Yes, Gio? <clears throat> Yes. Yes. So Jesus here is uh, speaking the Aramaic version of quoting Psalm 22. Psalm 22 begins with, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why have you forsaken me? And so every Jew there would have known this psalm. And every psalm except for one, every one of the 150 50 psalms except for one, always ends with some proclamation of hope and victory in God. And so Psalm 22, even though it details all of these horrific things that are foreshadowed in the crucifixion of Jesus, uh, for instance, things like, um, all who see me mock me, they curl their lips and jeer, they shake their heads at me. Where's the other part? Like water, my life drains away, all my bones are disjointed. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare at me and gloat. They divide my garments among them for my clothing. They cast lots. Sound familiar? So Jesus is quoting this not to proclaim that he is hopeless before God and thinks God has abandoned him. He's quoting it to let everyone else there know these prophecies that Psalm 22 foreshadowed are being fulfilled now. And Psalm 22 ends like this. And I will live for the Lord. My descendants will serve you. The generation to come will be told of the Lord that they may proclaim to a people yet unborn the deliverance you have brought. So it ends in hope. Some people will often point that as like, oh, that's a sign of Jesus' human nature that he was doubting. He wasn't doubting. He knew exactly what he was doing. And any Jewish person there who would have heard that quotation would have known exactly what Jesus was talking about. Even if they couldn't interpret it properly, they would have known that was Psalm 22. John. I have uh, two, actually I have three, but that's not good. Okay. Uh, the first one, just a uh, beautiful reflection. <coughs> Thanks. That was very edifying. Uh, the first one was um, that word that struck me, which that never actually rings, like, worked with me, but this one mm -hmm. did, mm -hmm. where it said, um, could you not keep watch for one hour? Mm -hmm. And then I was like, wait a minute. Like, one of the first things Adam was told was guard until in a freaking garden. Yeah. And we're back in a garden. That's right. Fail again. So it's like the new Adam really needed to come and fix this. That's right. I've never noticed that connection yeah, before. I that was interesting. That's very interesting. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if that's any of the fathers would have any commentary. But that sounds good to me. <laughs> I, I would not be surprised. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to share that. And yeah. Thank you. The other one was, I, I think that maybe it's just glossed over. I haven't really, is that there is this like complete emphasis on women being present mm -hmm. in, during the passion, yeah. which really is like so much uh, humbling, right? Mm -hmm. It's like the one guy that was there, he, he's not really like named. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's something that maybe like really talks about the dignity and the strength of women that, mm -hmm. that maybe is like overlooked or not mentioned because yeah. I mean, we have so many Marys, and we have Veronica, and then it mentions just women. Mm -hmm. And it's like, and all the apostles, like, you know, basically. Yeah. I mean, John would have probably, but Mary really yeah. kept, kept him. Yeah, we have John there in the Gospel of John, yeah. but it's very convenient that he writes himself into sure. the scene, you know, um, <laughs> just later. I was totally there, you guys. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> but we don't know. But yes, I think, and, and it's another piece of evidence for the historicity of Jesus being crucified and risen from the dead, because the first eyewitnesses to the resurrection were women. And if you read Jewish law, the testimony, the eyewitness testimony of women was not considered valid in any court of law at that time. So the fact that they are saying women were the eyewitnesses, I mean, if you're going to make up a story, this is the worst detail to include. Nobody would believe the, the legitimacy of this at this time. I mean, thankfully, that's not the case anymore. But at this time, that was the reality, that in order to prove that something happened definitively in a court of law, you needed two eyewitnesses that were male. 
and their testimony had to corroborate. In fact, today at Daily Mass, you heard the story, if you went, or if you read the readings of uh, Susanna, was it Susanna? Yeah, Susanna, um, and the two men who try and produce false testimony against her because they try and take her for themselves, and she decides to stand firm in her purity even if it leads to her death. And Daniel, the prophet, comes and hashes out that their testimony doesn't agree. So this is a great detail that this really happened, that from the actual eyewitness testimony of women that wouldn't have been considered at this time is actually proof for us that this had to have been the case because there's no other reason to include it if it had not been true. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions, things that stood out to you? Mike. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, the first believer was the Roman centurion. Yeah. Yeah. And again, another piece of evidence for the fact, like, why would you include that? If you're trying to convince the Jewish people that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, your first eyewitness of that when he dies is a non-Jewish person, like, give me a break. Like, nobody would have bought that if it had not been true. If the goal of the gospel writers was not to be accurate about what really happened, and they were actually lying to bring about some false messiah, then they would, have, they would have made this look completely above reproach according to Jewish law. They had no concern for that because they wanted to report it exactly as it happened. There's so many details like that in the gospel accounts that prove to us there's no other reason this should have been included other than if it really happened. Yeah, Jared? Uh, so Simon and like the, the Serenian guy, mm -hmm. Does he get any flack like from Romans or anything for helping Jesus out? Or? No, so Simon the Cyrenian, uh, he's a foreigner, uh, and so he's kind of, when you are uh, visiting anywhere within Roman territory, um, the Rome, I think the rule is that Roman authority can pledge you into service for up to one mile. And so whoever you are, if you're in Roman territory, it doesn't matter who you are, they can pledge you into service for up to one mile. So because they saw Jesus needed assistance, and they find this man who clearly stands out. He's not a local. He's a Cyrenian, which today would be modern-day Libya, northern Africa. Uh, and so they would have called him out to assist Jesus. Another important detail that I mentioned is that his sons are mentioned, Alexander and Rufus. And in fact, one of them uh, in Romans 16, verse 13, there's another mention of a Rufus. We don't know if this is the same one. And what's interesting is that these two may have become prominent eyewitnesses to Christ's resurrection in the early church, and yet they're not listed in the later Gospels because at this time when Mark wrote, they may have been well known. This 20 years after Jesus has died, but by the time the other Gospels have written, they may very well likely have been martyred, and there would have then been no reason to mention them because no one would have known who they were. So it's a, an, an, again, one of these small details that can point to some kind of historical truth about these people existing. So there is potentially a likelihood that Paul is talking about the same Rufus when he's writing to him in Romans uh, 16 and mentioning a lot of people he wants to greet. I don't know how common the name Rufus is um, at that time. Uh, the only Rufuses I know are the dad from Gossip Girl and the naked mole rat from Kim Possible. So um, it's not a common name that I'm aware of, um, but uh, yes, yeah, at that time, who knows? Who knows? I don't, I don't assume it's terribly common, but I'm not an expert on the name Rufus, so who knows? Yes? Yes, yeah, so Mary, the mother of Joseph and uh, the younger James. Um, younger James was one of the apostles, James the Lesser. This woman is often the woman who is confused with Mary, the mother of Jesus. Because if you look elsewhere in the Gospels, who does it say the names of Jesus's quote-unquote brothers are? James and Joseph. Because at this time, every woman's name is Mary, and it's really, really difficult to figure out who you're talking about. Okay, So you have Mary Magdalene, you have Mary the mother of Jesus, you have Salome, the mother of James and John, who is also sometimes called Mary. You have Mary the wife of Clopas, you have Mary who could be the same Mary mother of uh, wife of Clopas, who's the mother of Joseph and James the younger, so if, or James the lesser. So if you're not accurately looking and tracking who these characters are through scripture, it's easy to conflate them. So there are many instances where Jesus is listed as having quote-unquote brothers in Scripture that many non-Catholics will use as evidence against Mary's perpetual virginity. Mary's perpetual virginity was a teaching and a tradition that was held from the very earliest days of the church. 
But the name for brothers in Greek, adelphos, can mean any relative. It can mean cousin, it can mean kin. But in our English translation, it began to be a proof text that people would use to say, Mary wasn't a virgin, look, Jesus had brothers. But if you look at those figures, they actually are then attributed to other Marys later on, like here at the end of the gospel. So one of the people who was in that court of women following Jesus, supporting him financially, and you know, helping with whatever ministry you know, related costs there were. Um, I think uh, Joanna is the one who's the wife of Chusa, who was someone in Herod's court, so she was obviously very wealthy. So these were women with access and connections who were able to help Jesus do some of the ministry that he did. It also mentions there were many other women there that aren't named in this account. And if you track the names of the women who are present in all of the gospel accounts or all of the resurrection accounts, they vary slightly. I think the only one who is always there is Mary Magdalene. Every other account is slightly different. And we don't know, depending on what was happening in history contextually, what the awareness was of who was there. There's probably a very large group of women there. And each gospel writer chose to emphasize one or the other or only verify the ones they knew definitively were there. So we have that disparity. It doesn't mean it's an error. It just means that they recorded small groups of the larger group a little bit differently. Yeah, but that's who she is. Other questions? John. It's not a question. I just wanted to share this. Please. Um, some priest was telling me about like when he was visiting Mexico, mm -hmm. the crucifixes there are, are very gory, like you were yeah. describing, like not like our you know, yeah. sensibilities here. Mm -hmm. And um, this priest is educated at Pontifical University, and he couldn't get over the gash on Jesus' face mm -hmm. all the crucifixes. Mm -hmm. And he was so like you know upset because he didn't have anything for it. But he mm -hmm. talked to this farmer, and the farmer was like, "Oh, he's like, he's like that's the kiss of Judas." Mm -hmm. And then he, you know. He said it was the worst of the passion mm. pains because it came from a friend. Yeah. And um, I was like, well, that really hit me hard. Mm. And um, he's like, I learned more from that farmer than I did at all in university. Wow. And it's like, because it, it, it does mention it here, mm -hmm. he betrayed me by a kiss. And yeah. Like, that must have hurt. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And in fact, that actually is uh, prophesied in Psalm 41, uh, verse 10. Even my trusted friend who ate my bread has raised his heel against me. All of these signs and prophecies in the Old Testament pointing to these very distinct details of what happens in this account of Jesus' passion, proving that he is the Messiah who was promised. So yeah, that's very interesting. And there's another related story of Padre Pio. Uh, he, had, he was given the wounds of Christ, and he, um, he, they were very painful. In fact, he didn't like the attention he got from them. He actually asked God, like, leave the pain, take away the wounds. He didn't mind suffering and offering up his suffering for others. But he was once asked... Uh, he was asked, Padre Pio, which of the wounds is the most painful? So he had the wounds on his hands. I don't know if he had them on his feet or on his side, but he, he experienced the, the agony of Christ on the cross. And he said, uh, the wound on my right shoulder. And it became known as the hidden wound of Christ. That it was like some agonizing thing. Maybe the dislocation, maybe the carrying of the cross beam, whatever it may have been, part of the scourging. But yeah, it's interesting to reflect on these other wounds of Christ. You know, kind of the metaphorical wound of Judas that's depicted in, you know, the gorier crucifixes that John is talking about in Mexico. And all these other aspects of Jesus' woundedness that we don't, we don't really experience. If you read about the analyses they've done on things like the Sudarian and the Shroud of Turin, the burial cloths of Jesus, you can see how many actual wounds were inflicted. They can kind of pinpoint the different areas where blood pooled and all of the different cuts and gashes on Jesus' body. And there are dozens of wounds all over him. Uh, when they do that kind of spectral analysis of those artifacts. And so um, we, we are very, we've gotten very good at, um, what's the word? Softening or, um, um, yeah, sugarcoating, I guess. I can't think of the word I'm trying to say. Um, but the, the crucifixion of Jesus, making it very comfortable. Um, but it, it, it would be, difficult to hold the gaze for more than a moment of a historically accurate depiction of the crucifixion. That's why so many people had news reported, uh, reporting agencies on their reaction to the movie The Passion of the Christ when it came out, because it sought to be as historically accurate as possible, to remind us that this is what we did to Jesus. That was Mel Gibson's goal. In fact, Mel Gibson appears in The Passion of the Christ only in one part. It's his hands that are hammering the nail into Jesus. You never see his body, 
but he wanted it known that he understood that him as the director of this movie, he, as a representative of all of us, is responsible for what happened to Jesus. And that we need to come face to face with that to understand how bad the bad news is so we can then understand how good the good news is. So we read this passion account this week. I can't believe we're already out of time. We read this passion account this week when you hear it proclaimed on Sunday, when you hear it proclaimed maybe on Good Friday if you're here, and, and maybe even just sit with it in the Gospel of Mark and read through it a few times this week to really let that sink in. Like every word, maybe just pray the phrase, this was for me. You did this for me. You did this for me. I did this to you. You did this for me. Whatever version of that really speaks to you, just to really let this settle in that this was a biological reality of suffering that Jesus intended to suffer so that he could institute a new Passover where you and I can come every week, every day if we so choose, to worship and remember what he did for us. Not to show up and complain or expect to be entertained or be entitled by the different ways that we participate in the ministry. Look how great I read my book. Look how I hand out communion. Like, that's not what Mass is about. It's great that we participate, but the reason we come to Mass is to worship. That's the reason. The only reason. And if it wasn't for that, we shouldn't be doing it. It would just be a weird, not great glee club, I guess, without that purpose. Like, honestly, there's snack time, there's songs, You know, that's essentially what it would be. If it wasn't about worship, if it wasn't really Jesus. And we have, we risk turning it into that when we try and farm the mass for entertainment or for our own pleasure or for our own benefit instead of recognizing when I show up to mass, I am here to participate in an act of worship and thanksgiving for what Jesus did for me. And if that isn't really resonating or settling in, we need to spend more time with Mark 14 and Mark 15. One last thing, and then we'll end. Can you explain the emphasis that Mark provides versus the other gospel writers? Yeah, so briefly. Um, Mark, as I said, was written, believed uh, to be first written to the persecuted Christians in Rome, presenting Jesus as a God of action and power that would relate to those in Rome. Matthew was a Jewish writer writing to a Jewish audience about a Jewish Messiah. So he is very... uh, specific Jewish contextual things and traditions in his gospel that others do not. You get this sense of Jesus fulfilling the new Passover a lot more strongly in Matthew than you do in Mark. Uh, Luke was the gospel to the Gentiles. It has the most miracles. He seeks to investigate everything accurately anew, as he says in the first few verses. So it is the most chronologically an eyewitness account accurate, in my opinion, of all of the gospels. And he was also a physician, so it includes the most miracles. Uh, Because it's for Gentiles, it also includes the most interactions with women and with non-Jews. And they were all written about the same time within about five to ten years of each other. John was written a little bit after that. And his goal, instead of those three synoptic gospels, which means similar, is to present Jesus as the divine son of God. So his is very high theology, very highly poetic. They're all deeply valuable, but they all present those different um, perspectives for the needs or the audience that they were writing to at that time. Yeah. So there's a great benefit. In fact, if you want to take a look, do not take this book or I will come after you. But if you want to take a look, I have this really fun book called The Synopsis of the Four Gospels, where you can look at these accounts, every gospel right next to each other, every story in scripture. Um, and so you take a peek at that and maybe buy one for yourself. Um, but if you, uh, if you take this, I'm going to like St. Anthony on you. If you know the story of the dude who like stole his Bible, I'm going to go St. Anthony on you, okay? All right, let's pray. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for the cross. Thank you for your resurrection. Thank you for suffering unimaginably because we seek our own selfishness and sin. And instead of judging and condemning us, you stand with a solution to redeem us. And so help us not to speak judgment upon ourselves and separate us from your love but help us to recognize that your arms are still open and welcoming, beckoning us while you are up on the cross. So help us to see that your suffering is a gift, that our suffering is welcome here, and help us to offer our worship, to offer our time, our talent, our treasure, our presence in sacrifice and service, because what you did was of infinite worth, and we don't ever want to forget that. So help it not be lost on us especially this week. We pray all this in your most precious name, Jesus. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.